good afternoon. I'm very glad to see here uh, our small contingency of capacity building and policy community from the uh, European institutions and member states and also uh, from uh, the partner countries. So, and uh, I'm glad to kick off the panel on capacity building projects in service of the EU cyber diplomacy. Um, this panel and um, this last session today is talking about how the EU can advance our more global goals of advancing free, open and interoperable internet and uh, the fact that international law, norms of responsible state behavior and um, confidence building measures should be applied. The capacity is necessary everywhere right now. Everywhere where we are looking, we see in addition to the health pandemic, also the cyber pandemic. Um, in case of health pandemic, we have doctors, not enough of them, but still some doctors. In cyber pandemic, we clearly have lack of doctors. And this is the big um, question for us and challenge for us, how we are able to advance um, the capacity building in the situation where we have serious shortage of experts ourselves here in Europe, in the United States and in more technologically advanced nations. So the global shortage of cyber experts is 2 million, which is a large number. And uh, with this uh, project, the EU Cybernet, we are trying to um, do a bit of um, work in order to combine um, all the good EU experts together to one platform and one database to be uh, mobilized and applied externally for the EU capacity building projects. Uh, there is also a parallel uh, panel uh, uh, right now going on uh, that our colleagues in Germany are organizing and this panel is more directly talking about capacity building in Africa. So, but um, I would be now very glad to introduce my good colleague, uh, Ambassador Henry Verdier from France, who is the digital and cyber ambassador uh, of France and then he will uh, give us a scene setter uh, talking about uh, global requirements, the United Nations processes and how Europe can help the countries around the world um, to increase their cyber resilience. Thank you. Please, floor is yours. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Eli, for the invitation and for the opportunity to exchange on cyber capacity building, which is uh, an essential topic for cyber stability and for EU cyber diplomacy. Uh, I believe, I'm European, I believe that we are one of the most uh, engaged in international society of all the continents. But even if it weren't the case, I think that uh, as the networks interconnect us, the weakest link is a threat to all the network. And uh, the, leak, the, the weakest link uh, offers a door for attackers to harm the EU and is therefore a source of vulnerability. So um, cyber sharing capacity, financing capacity is a strategic issue for European security too. You remember all in this room that the Notpedia attack started first in Ukraine before extending to Europe and to the whole world. And that's why capacity building uh, of each capacity of each country to comply with its international commitments and responsibilities in the cyberspace is a concern for everyone and is a concern to us. This was rightly noted by this year's consensus open-ended working group report which underlined in its paragraph uh, 54 that, I, I quote, the international community's ability to prevent or mitigate the impact of malicious ICT activity depends on the capacity of each state to prepare and respond. This is one of the principal reasons why EU member states with Egypt and with uh, countries from all the world have been advocating since uh, 2020 
for the establishment of a program of action, a POA, in the United Nations. While the, the content of this initiative still needs to be elaborated and will be elaborated with all people that want to join the initiative, and then we'll propose this to the UN General Assembly, while the, its content still needs to be elaborated, certain instruments will have an important focus on strengthening capacity building efforts, matching them better with the most urgent needs of states, and sharing best practices to advance the implementation of agreed international norms. We believe that the time for states to concretely implement these norms and principles has come. We are taking, talking here about, we are, think, we are talking a lot about infrastructures, uh, about, but we need to, to talk also about states' official training, about legal frameworks that are respectful of citizen fundamental rights, about justice, we need states and administration to, to protect uh, a country. That's one of the most important parts of the POA initiative. The second part, the second ambition of this uh, initiative will be to engage private sector because we also have to face the fact that uh, our infrastructure are too weak and that there is a responsibility of private sector about a better and more secure IT with a culture of security by design. So, um, excuse me, I come back to my paper. Um, aside from this dimension, uh, cyber capacity building also plays a key role in the promotion of some important values and of a rule-based international order. Through the European cyber capacity building and the EVOS, we can and we concretely prove, so defend our conception of an open, free and secure cyberspace respectful of citizens' fundamental rights, while enabling, at the same time, states to exert their sovereignty in this field. Because we are convinced, and we consider that we prove this every day, that you can think both as issues together. To give states the tools to retain their digital sovereignty is necessary to tackle issues of common interest between the EU and other states, um, such, for example, as the protection of citizens, cyber attacks, espionage campaigns, the fight against cyber criminality and intellectual property theft. The EU has therefore a direct interest to engage in cyber capacity building. Else, it would be exposing itself to the diffusion of a model contrary to its value in its neighborhoods, and in the long run, the fragmentation of the internet would be the outcome of these dynamics. And I want to share this with you those days because we have some signals, the fragmentation of internet would be the worst threat on international stability. Because one other thing that does protect us is that we live in the same infrastructures and no one attacks the main infrastructures. It was just a side, <laughs> side note, but very important. So we have a direct interest to engage in cyber capacity building. And the EU has censored it. Uh, it has positioned itself as a leader to help states implement the UN recommendation for states in the cyberspace. And for that matter, I want to underline the great initiative that the EU cybernet is. By putting experts together, it helps rationalize the capacity building project efforts between member states and helps them to better coordinate with European projects. EU Cybernet also offers a good example of the type of mechanism that the POA could put in place at the international level to improve the coordination of capacity building efforts. In this way, it enables the EU position itself as a central player in the cyber capacity building field. It is important as capacity building is a subject of a sustained effort of lobbying by some large digital firms that seek to capture cyber markets and finance their offer on public development aid. They do this for profit, not to promote the general public interest. These initiatives have therefore to be balanced by a strong public commitment on the matter, and I am really glad that the EU can become this counterweight. This effort has to be sustained for cyber capacity building to be efficient, has to be conducted in the long run. This commitment has, be, has enabled Europe to be very active in terms of cyber capacity building in its neighborhood 
and I will let the EAS elaborate on this, but I'm confident that the dynamic launched by, at the European level is here to stay. Just a mention of the soon uh, French presidency of the uh, European Union. I can share with you that given the crucial importance of this matter, France will support European capacity building efforts during all its presidency. And we will push for a strong Euro-African partnership. Building a strong cybersecurity partnership with Africa should be one of the deliverable at the next EU-AU summit in February. Cyber capacity building in the Western Balkans will also be a priority for the upcoming French presidency of the EU. So that's where some words, uh, but thank you very much again for the invitation and for your attention. And now I leave the floor back to Eli. Thank you, Henry. Uh, I have to see whether we have a question for you from the audience, which I don't see. So I have a question myself. Um, if you are looking um, now um, at the global uh, um, capacity building state of play, so where would you focus your efforts both geographically and also thematically as a first priority? Mm -hmm. So I have the feeling that I did share a bit. From our perspective, we have uh, Europe as a, for a lot of reasons, we have to do something with Africa. Uh, we live in the same uh, time zone. Uh, we have a long common history. We understand each other, and uh, we are more and more interdependent of uh, Africa. We have to to cooperate a lot with Africa about topics. I cannot answer like this, but I can here introduce a very important um, idea. A good uh, capacity building strategy is here to empower the states, to free them, not to take control of them. So we have to have small and quick uh, cooperation and then to let the keys <laughs> to the partner. So we will try to, to promote also this idea. But I feel that most Europeans share this very important issue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So, and now we are going on with um, the panel. Um, I understand uh, we have um, uh, the Panelists prepared, uh, are they mic'd up, all of them? So please come and uh, join me here uh, at the podium. Hello, good afternoon. I'm very glad to see two Dutch ladies here. So, uh, and uh, also one uh, colleague from, uh, where are you right now, Patrick? I'm still in Florence. Still in Florence, yes. So, but you are uh, usually in Brussels. So, uh, our panel here um, uh, is consisting of distinguished um, and, um, member state and uh, European officials. I start with Manon, uh, my good colleague from the EAS who is the head of cyber sector and is uh, continuing the good fight here in the EU to uh, make sure that um, foreign security policy and uh, defense policy issues are um, uh, guarded and taken care of uh, in all the uh, European Union policy uh, f perspectives. So then we have um, Marete uh, from um, uh, the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, who is uh, uh, a new addition to our cyber community and uh, is heading the cyber task force in the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then uh, Patrick Pavlak, um, who uh, is the Brussels executive officer of the EU ISS, the EU Institute for Security Studies, and also is the head of the EU Cyber Direct, which is one of the diplomatic um, projects that the EU has set up several years ago in order to provide policy support for the European Union uh, uh, different uh, cyber policies. So um, our panel today is um, discussing how we can help with our European perspective, the global um, like-minded uh, goals of the Western uh, like-minded community to keep uh, internet free and open, as Henry was uh, also pointing out <coughs> previously, to make sure that freedom and security can be balanced in cyberspace and also given good uh, model, the European model for those countries 
who are still looking for setting up their capacity building um, systems uh, and uh, cyber resilience structures. So um, I think uh, inside of the European Union, we have very different countries, large and small and medium. And uh, amongst them and amongst us, we can have different models to offer for the third countries outside. Uh, we have been also very active in funding certain projects already. And I think Manon has an overview of what the EU already has been doing uh, in this field. And also, if you could elaborate, what do you think are the challenges for the next stage or, uh, of the EU capacity building? So what's the, what's the plan for the growth? What's the Please. plan? What's the plan ahead? Indeed. Well, I mean, first, let me also uh, congratulate yourself um, uh, on uh, all the work that you have actually done within the EU on cyber capacity building. Uh, as many of you know, Heli is my predecessor uh, and has really um, uh, built a strong cyber capacity building policy at EU level, where uh, cyber capacity building was already core to the EU cyber diplomacy effort since the first cybersecurity strategy uh, in 2013, and we were really also at the forefront of thinking about cyber capacity building principles and advancing EU's core values uh, through capacity building efforts. And for instance, the council conclusions of uh, 218 in this regard really reflected the EU vision when it comes to uh, cyber capacity building. We also now see that the international community has taken over uh, that work and has uh, developed uh, norms or common understanding, we should say, based on uh, our values and principles when designing and implementing uh, cyber capacity building. Um, the UN process has also agreed that capacity building should be tailored uh, and that there's a need for international cooperation and stakeholder coordination in this regard. And we see an opportunity also for the EU to contribute to that work through various um, fields, uh, notably, of course, the, the GFCE, but Marcia will go into detail probably on, on the work of the GFCE in that regard, but also through the program of action where we see um, opportunities to advance uh, cooperation on uh, capacity building at the international level. Uh, there we see also connection with the work uh, under the 230 agenda and linking resilience, development and capacity building uh, as uh, core um, policy fields uh, and really implementing that through different work streams uh, uh, that uh, we have been doing, again, since uh, Heli uh, started that work within the union, uh, both on, on crime, on security, where we now also see the development going into, okay, what can we do under capacity building for cyber diplomacy, for states to meaningfully engage in the UN processes, uh, something that Henry also uh, mentioned just now, and seeing, okay, how can uh, the European Peace Facility actually contribute to further uh, advance advancing international security and stability by providing capacity building through uh, that mechanism. Um, but in particular, uh, we see uh, the, the challenge for the EU and which is also an opportunity at the same time, obviously, uh, to really develop this coherent agenda and really put all these efforts together by all the stakeholders, not only when it comes to institutions, but also agencies, EU projects, member states, partners that we work with, um, as well as international partners or countries and the private sector that are all engaging in a certain form or shape of uh, capacity building, or better maybe said engagement, and to see how we can bring that together to really um, better invest and better implement uh, in capacity building uh, uh, around the world. Um, and there we are uh, part of the cybersecurity strategy. And I think uh, Viktor Stanetsky, uh, uh, deputy head of the division of the security and defense division this morning also elaborated on it uh, to establish this board uh, of institutional actors that will be able to um, engage on cyber capacity building in certain regions, uh, as well as develop uh, an EU cyber capacity building agenda that will allow us to um, really invest uh, and plan uh, a in a coordinated uh, uh, agenda for uh, capacity building uh, around the world. Um, and there we see again an opportunity to bring that, uh, translate that, the work that has been doing, that is going to be done through uh, that board, but also the work that is going to be done uh, uh, by, for instance, Cybernet in this regard, translate that to the international level, both again in the GFCE, which is uh, doing that at the international level, as well as within the POA, where the POA can be an enabler for 
for the capacity building community uh, to bring that together to improve program and to, to actively participate in discussions in this context. So um, I will leave it at uh, that and I'm looking forward to the further discussions. Thank you, Manon. Let's move on uh, we, uh, to um, Martin. Can you please uh, tell us uh, what has been the Dutch experience so far? And I think we are all uh, visiting quite often the GFC events and uh, we have been uh, very glad to have this global um, forum that binds us all together and also the private sector actors, uh, not just the governments and governmental agencies. So um, uh, what, what would you tell us um, uh, about the lessons learned specifically by the Dutch government and, and where have we, ha, where have, um, where do, would you advise us to um, focus now further in our efforts uh, to make sure that we are more joined up and coordinated in global capacity building? Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today as a noob or a newly uh, here in the area uh, of uh, cyber capacity building. Um, so I'm very pleased that I was invited to talk about that today. Um, well, if we go back a little bit in time uh, with respect to, to this topic, um, uh, in, as you maybe know, in, in 2015, the Netherlands organized the global uh, conference on cyberspace um, and, um, and, and capacity building featured uh, prominently on the agenda of the conference. And as a, um, as a result of the conference, the uh, Global Forum on uh, Cyber Expertise was created by the members, um, uh, so the states, the companies, and uh, intergovernmental organizations. And maybe just to stress, the Netherlands is, is a member of, that, uh, of, of the Global Forum. And it's, the Netherlands is not the Global Forum. So we, are, we, we just, Gave it. it is in The Hague indeed, but um, we are just a member and because we have organized uh, the global conference in 2015, we are co-chair as well, like India as a co-chair. Um, so, um, so what is, I think, the strength of the, uh, as an outsider looking at the GFCE, uh, what I see as the strength uh, of the GFCE is that they coordinate uh, existing international efforts, and they um, uh, um, look at uh, the um, the needs, the um, um, uh, expertise, and resources available, and in that sense, is connecting the dots. And um, yeah, so um, so I think they play in that sense a very interesting part, also because it's a neutral body. And apart from um, the GFCE, I think also it would be important uh, to mention um, the, um, the World Bank uh, uh, Fund um, and, and also um, because it has a, a similar uh, membership. It is, it, it is bigger and I think that is very important that we go beyond the European uh, focus and see what is needed in the different regions and try to, uh, to specify for those specific needs uh, in those regions. Um, if we look at the challenges that, are current, that we currently have, I think that is focus because there are so many different initiatives have been uh, evolved over the last years. Um, and focus, I think, is very important and also to streamline, to see what is available and how can we divide the work or can we, um, you know, um, how should I say it, um, complement each other. Um, and I think there is a um, opportunity as well uh, since the GFCE, the World Bank, uh, the Cyber Peace Institute and the World Economic Forum are um, globally, uh, are, sorry, are currently uh, exploring opportunities uh, to organize a high level um, uh, cyber capacity uh, conference uh, in 2022. And that would, I think, would be a very interesting uh, opportunity to see how we uh, move forward on this. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. I think, uh, yes, you are uh, giving us a very um, uh, good leads here, what we need to do and, and uh, have more the, of the stakeholder um, engagement and also the clearinghouse and coordination. So, uh, Patrick, um, you have been dealing with the cyber issues now for some six years, and I think uh, we can call you the European cyber veteran soon. So, if, uh, <laughs> if this is something which uh, you can uh, easily take, since you are still, um, I think, uh, 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 relatively young biologically, but in cyber years, I think we are all veterans here, right? Um, can you, Patrick, tell us when do you remember our first meetings um, in 2015, 2016, when we started to set up everything and all the projects and uh, where um, there was just an idea? And now we have many projects. We have um, um, the capacity building projects outside of Europe. We have uh, projects inside, like your, your project, CyberDirect. We have um, the community that has been created around those projects. And uh, uh, we already, in some parts, have been doing very serious work um, of uh, capacity building outside Europe. So, and, um, and how um, would you evaluate? Uh, what kind of lessons learned uh, you think that um, we have had from the achievements in the past? And if you would like to maybe give some recommendations to this capacity building community, which is currently watching this um, uh, event uh, here in the room and also uh, in <laughs> streamed into the internet. So what would be the recommendations, like free recommendations, uh, where to focus next? Uh, please, the floor is yours, Patrick. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ali, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as I've mentioned, I'm uh, in Florence, where we have just completed another edition of the European Cyber Diplomacy Dialogue, which in itself is a sort of a capacity building exercise uh, targeting really domestically the EU cyber ambassadors, but also bringing uh, a commun small community of experts working on various cyber related issues. Um, and you will not be surprised to know that over our uh, two days of deliberation, cyber capacity building is something that has been actually coming up quite uh, extensively. Uh, but Heli gave me a very specific task right now to talk a bit about the lessons learned uh, and uh, threw me in this uh, very nice basket of uh, cyber veterans, which I really take as a, as a sort of a badge of honor because that community has uh, indeed expanded, but there is a small group of people who have been following uh, these developments uh, regularly and sort of uh, st stuck to uh, those developments and monitored them. And I think one of the big observations that I have is actually that, uh, you know, despite the, uh, the environment really moving and evolving, a lot of the conversations that we keep having are actually the same ones that, uh, Heli, you might remember exactly we had in 2014, 2015. So maybe let me try uh, to tap into some of those discussions or maybe elements that I think we, um, uh, we could be looking at again and try to reevaluate when we, uh, as we look forward. And when we talk about cyber capacity building and the service of cyber diplomacy, for me, there are two main angles, I think, to, to focus on. Uh, one being the internal, cyber capacity building and the service of EU cyber diplomacy externally. And that has two sort of uh, tracks, I would argue. One would be really focusing that on the fact that our diplomats posted in the delegations, but also working on foreign and security issues more broadly, should become more and more proficient in uh, cyber and digital issues. So I think that's maybe partly what the uh, EU cyber diplomacy network will aim to achieve, something that Manon will be working on with the external action service and the member states in the coming months. But at the same time, we also need to ensure that the cyber and digital experts uh, are becoming more proficient on different aspects on, of cyber diplomacy. So whether we talk about increasing cyber resilience, cyber crime, we need to make sure that the experts we're working with and those that will be part of the uh, EU CyberNet network do have awareness at least of what the key uh, priorities are when it comes to cyber um, diplomacy more broadly. The second big chunk, I think, is um, the cyber capacity building focused exter externally at the service of uh, other countries helping them to basically have at least the minimum level of uh, capacities and understanding of what those debates are about. And I think over the past years, uh, also for EU CyberDirect, as you have mentioned, we have really tried to make sure that 
uh, countries who would normally maybe not be able to take part in the discussions of the open-ended working group uh, or other international venues really have at least the chance to uh, to be physically in the room and um, speak up their uh, their mind and positions. Um, so as Henri Verdier also mentioned at the beginning, the focus of this external cyber capacity building, and you highly alluded that, to that as well, is to really make sure that the states have a capacity to meet their international obligations but also have this capacity to uh, ensure that other states respect their rights. Uh, now, I think there are two caveats to that, to that statement. We very often assume that this is happening in a very um, a consensual environment. Uh, I would say, uh, yes, cyber capacity building indeed is one of those areas in the discussions of the Open-Ended Working Group or GGE, where everybody agrees this is a priority. But I think we have to be mindful of the fact that um, it's not necessarily fully consensual uh, field. When we talk about implementation of norms or uh, giving states a capacity to comply with their obligations or exercise their rights under international law, for instance, there is really no full agreement on what that means. We have two consensual reports, but if you really read for the open-ended working group report, for instance, you will notice that there is a number of states who, despite their disagreement with some of their conclusions, decided not to block it. So sort of abstained from uh, going actively against their report. And I think it's not necessarily the same as saying that we have a full agreement. So uh, we have to acknowledge a bit more that the fact that there are still certain differences among the states. Um, but we also have to accept the fact that uh, giving states the capacity to be more active in international domain, so something that uh, Henri Verdier referred to as giving states digital sovereignty, doesn't necessarily imply that those states will always uh, take the same positions as the European Union. Uh, so there is this political risk that needs to be really very clearly acknowledged and taken on board from the very beginning as we engage uh, in cyber capacity building. Of course, there the role of uh, EU delegations in helping us pick up those weak signals and where the uh, uh, different countries might be evolving in order to design those more tailored cyber capacity building might be, uh, might be really important. And maybe there's a third element that I would like to uh, finish with, and it goes in two directions, one on the language and the other one on the content. We talk a lot about cyber capacity building. One of the ideas we have been discussing here in Florence over the past two days is whether maybe the EU should not start thinking about adapting the vocabulary that it's using. So maybe start thinking more in terms of building cyber capacity partnership or uh, cyber security partnership rather than cyber capacity building uh, all the time. That will set a different tone for the conversation with the partner countries and maybe uh, project a more equal footing in these conversations. And the second point I would like to make is maybe more on the content, uh, maybe on the content that even could feed into the conversation that we're having with regards to the program of action, which I know everybody is trying to fill in with, uh, with some ideas right now. And Henri Verdier again mentioned uh, that this initiative has been particularly co-sponsored by France and Egypt. I was glad that he mentioned Egypt because Egypt in its submissions to the open-ended working group, for instance, was very uh, outspoken when it comes to promoting this concept of common but differentiated responsibility in cyberspace. So the fact, uh, the idea that basically was borrowed really from the environmental law, but that questions the fact that we all or all states have the same levels of responsibility and obligations in international um, uh, cyber domain. And I think that's maybe something that we as the European Union can try to push forward as a conversation under the POA or other initiatives. You know, how do we deal with this question or the assumptions of some states that even though we all have this responsibility for cyberspace, we might actually have different uh, obligations and uh, commitments that we have to comply with. What does this common but differentiated responsibility means in practice? Um, and I think that's definitely the sort of a part of the equation of the dialogue that the EU could be, uh, could be really contributing with. But we're again, these uh, projects that you highly have mentioned that are both engaged internally and externally in uh, cyber capacity building could be used in order to, um, uh, to fit in and help us uh, sort of provide more content or meat on the bone if you want. 
And, and just one final lesson that I think we have learned uh, from uh, from cooperating with many different projects, EU CyberNet, but I imagine Cyber for Dev and Glassy Plus are also in other in uh, in this or other rooms during the conference. I think what we have realized really very uh, soon by working on Cyber Forum, for instance, is that when we actually work together we have this much bigger impact than when we act as individual projects. And I think that's the lesson that maybe the EU and the member states could also uh, draw from this uh, conversation. Uh, you know, I'm very happy to see a Dutch and Estonian uh, duo on the stage because you have been really the, uh, the sort of a power couple of European cyber capacity building. But I think what we could really try to maybe generate is how do we bring more, uh, more states on board. I'm very happy with the French declaration that Africa and Western Balkans will be on, uh, on their agenda as a priority countries. But again, we have to make sure that these declarations really go beyond words and start translating into concrete initiatives and engagement with, uh, with the states in the, in the regions. And I'll uh, stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you for your compliments for this um, uh, team uh, here on the podium. And I think uh, you actually uh, mentioned something which is really important, that uh, those um, uh, European projects uh, have created cumulative value uh, which is uh, going beyond the objectives of the each project, but there is this cumulative, lef uh, cumulative effect. Um, and in some regions, I think, the, uh, for instance, we are working now closely with the Dominican Republic, uh, where um, Classy and Classy Plus were first there, uh, doing the cyber crime capacity building. And then um, I think now the cybernet uh, is um, uh, also active in, uh, in Dominican Republic. And I remember two days ago talking with our friends uh, in the Dominican Republic who are producing the second cyber strategy for the country. And they asked me whether they should also um, put together the cyber diplomacy strategy while they already do all these strategies now. And, and I was advising them that maybe they put cyber diplomacy under the second strategy because uh, uh, this is what the Estonians did uh, in the beginning with the first versions of the strategies. So I think there are many uh, very uh, positive examples how uh, uh, with EU projects and also with bilaterally we are all uh, working with many of the, of the um, uh, third countries. And um, uh, somehow I think um, we are uh, having a lot of collective influence, I guess, as Europeans actually, because the number of countries we all are working with is big and if the European Union project is going, maybe, or the projects are going to different regions and strengthening where our priorities are, then it just amplifies what our goals are politically uh, there. But um, uh, uh, picking up from the Patrick's last point, I wanted to ask you, Manon, about um, the future of the UN discussions, both uh, in the first committee and third committee. And, and what, uh, what do you think um, uh, we, Europeans in this field, in capacity building field, can do uh, maybe more in order to uh, attract the middle ground countries um, to think uh, that um, uh, freedom of internet and security of internet can go hand in hand. Thank you, thank you indeed. Um, I think also picking up on some points that, uh, that were made before, uh, translating also um, the discussion that we had to what is actually needed. Um, and that's what we see, for instance, in the discussion on uh, third committee issues, so on cyber crime issues, there is a real need to tackle cyber crime. There's a lot of countries around the world that are greatly suffering from this. And we're having these discussions uh, also to help uh, states to to tackle this uh, this rising threat, and there we we have to um, listen to their need, and at the same time show uh, through EU's capacity building uh, projects uh, that you can actually have security and tackle cyber crime while respecting human rights and fundamental freedoms at the same time. And these things are not, uh, it's not a zero sum game between. Uh, it's something that you can do at the same time. And we have showed uh, that uh, through our efforts and 
our partnerships, because I completely agree with Patrick, these are rather partnerships, should show actually the way uh, that, um, that we are doing it. Vice versa, we can also learn from, uh, from countries around the world with who we partnered it, how they uh, tackle cyber crime, um, uh, for instance, when it comes to, to the uh, third committee uh, discussions. So it is, a, it is a back and forth of um, uh, discussing uh, and listening to each other, translating needs from uh, partner countries to uh, projects uh, uh, in the EU. And there again, picking up on, on something that Patrick said, um, we're, we're looking at more uh, engagement through various means. So um, having a partnership does not only mean that you have capacity building projects, but that you actually also have a sustained engagement, which includes, as you, you said yourself, meetings, for instance, where we have bilateral meetings and engage, where we organize certain events or panel discussions, uh, where we have um, uh, small trainings or larger uh, uh, projects uh, running, but that we have this sustained um, uh, and Patrick once joked, persistent engagement, European way, uh, but the idea of really uh, having these partnerships of which capacity building is one of uh, the elements where in these partnerships we can exchange, we can support, uh, and we can show uh, that model of uh, an open uh, and free uh, cyberspace where you still um, uh, have protection and security against uh, cyber threats. And there I see a link also with the GFC, if I may make it, because there, for instance, there's this Africa project now under the GFCE, uh, which is super useful for the whole global community in that sense because we are looking indeed at Africa, uh, the African partners, uh, as well as Western Balkans, uh, uh, to engage and to shape that partnership um, through the ambition of having an agenda and having this roadmap. We are collecting, okay, what are we actually doing and what can we do? Where are the gaps? Where are the, uh, the, the opportunities uh, for us to um, advance our cooperation? And then linking that with the work of the GFCE, who is designing the need, who's working also with the community to see what's there and completing this puzzle um, uh, together uh, is what is needed. And, and this point of focus and then at the international level, bringing again together all these agencies or all these, these initiatives, uh, such as also the World Bank, et cetera, would be very valuable. And, and we, in that sense, see a role for the program of action uh, to really bring this community together and to see whether that mapping and that coordination through the respective, between the respective initiatives can also take place there, where actually in the POA, hopefully uh, in due time, all uh, UN members uh, are, are coming together uh, to this discuss uh, these issues. Thank you, Manon. This was a brilliant answer to the question. And let's move on to Marcia now. You mentioned the big meeting which is coming up organized by GFC and um, World Economic Forum and so on. Uh, so can, can you give us already maybe um, some hints uh, what will be discussed there? Uh, what is the agenda? And uh, maybe some homework for us so that we can prepare properly for for the uh, meeting because I think it is important actually to have the clearinghouse and coordination in this field and, and, and I'm very glad that the GFC is, um, is now organizing them like a big tent type of uh, event again because we haven't had a big tent type of um, cyber event now for a long time because of the yeah. pandemic and all the other, other developments. So yeah. can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, you know, I'm very happy as well that finally we can meet in person again and mm -hmm. so this is a uh, the first uh, step. Um, well, maybe just to also add to what you were saying about the, the African um, um, initiative now, by the next month, right? Yeah, so then all the different uh, African partners will come to the Netherlands and exchange for several days. It's very good to have that opportunity to really exchange and again uh, talk about what are the needs, what are the resources and connect all the dots. Um, I think also what is interesting is the clearinghouse um, uh, um, mechanism that the GFC uses and, and Sybil where they, for, for exchanging and, and, and sharing all the information that each different country or region has and to, to um, 
to feed it into maybe other regions. Like th that is also really the meaning of this uh, meeting of African partners is to see what does it do for other regions? How can they take their lessons out of it? So with regards to the, ne to the conference next year, I'm really sorry, but I, from, apart from capacity building, um, uh, it's, uh, um, I find it hard to really uh, to give you insight because I simply don't know it. I have ideas, definitely, and, and I think uh, there are several uh, uh, topics on the agenda currently, which you also mentioned already, Manon, uh, that, that, that might be interesting. But to be honest, I don't know. I don't know exactly what the... Uh, um, content of the uh, conference will be. So we can send you ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think, well, the EU as members obviously can send ideas. I think everyone can send send ideas. Um, yeah, definitely. We will do this. We'll yeah. Send you ideas. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Patrick, um, I ask you something which uh, we discussed in the UN GG a lot actually, when. Um, when the UN uh, group of governmental experts, the last round started in 2019, there were regional um, consultations, uh, as you might remember, because you were, I think, heading one of the regional consultations with non-state actors here in Brussels. And then the um, regional organizations were giving their advice to the chair of the UNGG, and also the um, GG experts from this region were in the room when we had these discussions. And, uh, and there was a strong regional um, uh, focus on the last uh, GG process. So uh, I, I would have a question for you because you have been um, engaging with other uh, regional uh, organizations in this field, in OI with the OIS, with African Union, with uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN Regional Forum. And uh, uh, how would you maybe um, compare the regions and how would you uh, assess uh, the success of the interregional uh, coordination, because I gather that there is um, also the interregional coordination, for instance, between uh, Latin American region and African region, and uh, they sometimes uh, are having a joint uh, conferences, and I remember talking to one of those conferences where most of the um, uh, audience was uh, a non-Western audience, and it was also very interesting to see the reflections on the UN processes and, and everything that we usually do not hear in the capitals uh, here in Europe and, and um, in our meetings in Brussels. So um, how would you uh, maybe assess uh, the success of the regions learning from each other? Because we uh, always try to, or we like to think that we Europeans have been talking and engaging uh, with all other regions and, and we hope that they will also like um, pass the ball to the others and, and they teach others and I think uh, this, in, to a certain extent, already has happened. So what, what is your feeling? Yeah, no, it, absolutely. And it's a perfect uh, point that you're making, Halley, the role of uh, regional organizations when it comes to cyber capacity building. I think the main thing we have to keep in mind is that really each of these organizations that you have mentioned has its own characteristics. So while regional organizations, in my view at least, should be one of the main vehicles for the EU's engagement on cyber capacity building exactly because they can help us contextualize this engagement and partnerships that we would like to build, we also have to keep in mind that organizations like ASEAN are completely different than organizations of American states in terms of what they can really achieve, where you saw OAS having really this much more implementing power when it comes to engagement and ASEAN maybe less so. Uh, then of course you have organizations like the African Union Commission, which gives us a slightly different flavor to the conversations in the sense that the important element there are really regional communities with all these sub-regional flavors that they have. And I think that is there's an important lesson there because in terms of African Union Commission and then working with ECOA, SADC and other organizations at the sub-regional level, we then also maybe can transpose some of those conversations to regions like Latin America, where we also have sub-regional organizations like Mercosur and others that have slightly different uh, competences. And we as EU Cyber Direct try to do it as well for different mapping activities that we have done and the papers that we have published where we look at different regions, but also uh, sub-regions as well. Now, I think one important um, element maybe to keep in mind, and that's probably a lesson or an observation for the whole community and not only, not only for regional organizations, 
is that we have to be very clear in the distinction we make between cyber diplomacy capacity building uh, versus cyber capacity building for uh, diplomacy. Uh, and I think these are slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, conversations to be had. I think cyber diplomacy is a cyber capacity building, excuse me, as a tool for uh, diplomacy allows us really to have the conversations on a lot of different issues like national strategies, the implementation of those uh, national cybersecurity strategies, because we highly mentioned uh, this idea of the Dominican Republic actually, you know, adopting a new one. I think what we have seen very often is that states, even though they develop the strategies, they really lag behind in the implementation. That's, that's definitely something that we should be pushing for. But that is completely different than focusing on cyber diplomacy capacity building as a completely different area of responsibility where we go and build capacity, for instance, to engage on international law. And something that we have, very, have heard very often by engaging with those different organizations and countries that you have mentioned is uh, this very simple question of where does the money come from? Because their concern is that our engagement on cyber diplomacy capacity building takes away from this cyber capacity building as a diplomatic uh, tool. Uh, so I think we have to be quite transparent there as well when we engage and build those partnerships to make sure that countries and their states, that's not a pool of money in the pot that comes uh, and that takes away from the investment in digital infrastructure, developing and implementing strategies, or uh, I don't know, building the capacities of uh, judges or law enforcement agencies. But this is an additional uh, resource that we're putting at their disposal, because that's something that they are uh, really concerned about. And maybe if I can look really a bit in the future and uh, let me flag, of course, that most of you are aware that the EUISS has recently published a report that another veteran of this community, Halley, has, uh, has authored, Naya Barbalyu, who was sitting in the uh, uh, in the council, the GDEFCO at that time uh, producing both council conclusions and uh, supporting our work on the operational guidance, for instance. The report that they have produced has really a lot of very valuable recommendations for the international community, GFCE, and the EU as such. So I would, I would really encourage everybody to, to look in there. But one element that really is important for me right now uh, when we're having the conversations on the EU side is how the new focus on the investment in digital infrastructure and digital engagement is going to be sort of a factor in, in our engagements on cyber uh, capacity building and cyber initiatives. I see there a very big risk with a lot of those initiatives being completely disconnected. And I think we have to really think very hard uh, when potentially those digital engagements initiatives can be creating those negative external externalities and more vulnerabilities that we as a cyber capacity building community will have to patch later on. I think this uh, uh, cybersecurity by design element needs to be really very clearly incorporated there. And I don't have the impression that is always the case. So maybe that's something that really goes in the direction of uh, Manon as they will be working on the agenda but probably uh, towards the GFCE, where many of those uh, initiatives also end up. EU CyberNet, of course, has a big plan and trainings for uh, EU staff and partner countries as well. So I think that's definitely an element that, in my view, should be part of that uh, conversation. So I went a bit beyond the original organizations, but I think this point also needs to be taken into account, really, when we think about those engagements. It's a very serious point that you made in the end that uh, we have to make sure that all these in new initiatives are joined up with the existing ones and, and also to make sure that all the new digital projects will have trust and security written in there as a um, component. Uh, our new mm. IT minister in Estonia is talking about um, the need to set a certain percentage of uh, cyber uh, expenditure from the IT budget. And uh, so I am always asking him to come up uh, with the number exactly, and uh, I hope he will soon. And uh, I think this kind of idea is circling around uh, some time that certain uh, percentage of the budget should, should go to the security of the systems, uh, because just setting up the new systems with no trust and security, uh, I think this is dangerous, yes. So uh, we have uh, questions from the uh, audience. If you allow me to read some questions. Um, first question, uh, are there any specific strategies being considered to address the global shortage in skills or within the EU? And the second question, I think, goes more uh, towards Patrick. 
which is um, that uh, Mr. Khan Sahin rightfully mentioned this morning that there is a growing need of research and evidence-based cyber capacity building. And uh, the question to Patrick, has um, cyber capacity building research matured already and has it become a common practice, for instance, in a global forum of cyber expertise? So let's go to it's the same order. Manon, you first. Skills and then skills, skills. Uh, capacity building research. Yes, indeed. So um, indeed, uh, I think we're, we're looking at one of the initiatives uh, here today uh, because uh, CyberNet was uh, indeed established to enhance uh, the skills of uh, the EU in cyber capacity building and also being able to transfer those skills to a broader community. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have obviously within the European Commission uh, programs under the digital strategy to enhance the broader skills of EU and um, on, on uh, uh, cyber, as well as new technologies um, uh, that uh, require really to step up the workforce and increase the workforce because I think that's something that we, we all um, struggle with. So there's uh, the EU as such enhancing its workforce on cybersecurity, on digital skills, on new tag, as well as the ability to then leverage those skills through CyberNet through to uh, uh, third countries in, in EU project that we do. Uh, and there, uh, we also ourselves have sometimes uh, to learn how we can uh, translate everything that's happening uh, in the domain uh, to uh, our workforce and to uh, our policies. And there, I would like to maybe pick up on one of the points that Patrick uh, just made uh, on cyber diplomacy as a capacity building effort or cyber diplomacy for uh, capacity building for uh, cyber diplomacy efforts. And there, I think these two are hand in hand and they're, they're basically two sides of the same coin, as something that we usually say about digital and cyber. Uh, but there, um, if you look, for instance, at uh, the UNGGE reports and the fact that we need to translate that to our policies in the EU, and that you can almost say that some parts of the implementation of the cybersecurity strategy align with the implementation of the UNGGE report. Uh, and if you better understand through cyber diplomacy capacity building the meaning and, and the engagement in the UNGDE reports, you are then better able to, through capacity building for diplomacy, implement that. And that is coming back actually to the first sentence that I said today, really trying to make cyber capacity building work for international security and stability through connecting this internal and external uh, dimension. And for that, you indeed need uh, the workforce uh, in order to be able to, to do that. So, Thank you. So let's go on. Uh, Marty, would you like to um, I think answer? Patrick, definitely. Uh, if you have uh, something to say, then... Uh, it's okay. I'll okay. just uh, skip here. So then, Patrick, <laughs> please, the floor is yours. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and thank you for the question. Um, has cyber capacity building research matured enough and already? Well, you know, if, if as part of the GFC, of course, we have the research council that has been established with several projects underway. And we have tried to uh, contribute with our own uh, piece of a puzzle uh, with the trends report that uh, Naya Barbalu and Robert Collette have uh, contributed, uh, have, uh, have written. But I think one of the things that for me is always really very um, sort of um, insightful when it comes to the research on cyber capacity building is really the absence of data when it comes to doing really very valuable research. And we had the same problem uh, working on the report where, for instance, one of the main sources of information for us was civil portal. Now, the civil portal does a lot of mapping on the projects that uh, are implemented globally, but frankly, very often, really the information and the conclusions you can draw from the information that it's there is very limited. So we can have information, for instance, about the number of projects implemented in a region. We can have information about the number of implementers, for instance, being um, active. But what is really very missing, if, or very often missing, is the scope of those projects. What are their objectives? What is the funding that is going towards those uh, initiatives? So you cannot, sometimes you're really looking at the project that might be worth 10 million dollars, sorry, 10 million euros with a lot of activities happening under the same uh, uh, umbrella, let's say Glassy Plus, that's counted as a one specific project. 
and then you would have, let's say, 50 activities of $100,000 euros. What's wrong with my dollars today? With 100,000 euros that are actually not maybe, maybe necessarily the, as a similar impact for us as, as the others. So I think we really need more data, and that's probably the call towards member states and other actors in this domain to basically be providing that information. But that also highlights a really very important point uh, when it comes to research on cyber capacity building, and that's the methodology. We really have to be careful when we look at those reports to sort of verify what is the basis for some of the conclusions that are being presented, because there is a risk that at the end of the day, our decisions on the investment and projects might be misguided by, uh, by the data that is being used. Now, uh, of course, what I would like to see as a researcher is really much more work being done and grounded in other disciplines that have been looking at capacity building more broadly over years, be it in political science or development studies, to really try to uh, streamline a bit more our conversations about cyber capacity building. There is a big body of literature on those topics already looking at capacity building and domain of security more broadly that we should also be looking at and try to, uh, try to borrow. And one final point, I think we should not be confusing research with, for instance, needs assessment. I mean, very often you could, um, argue that the need assessment can play the role of this research-based product that helps us guide our decisions about where to uh, invest money and where, what, what type of projects to prioritize. I think that's ne not necessarily always a very useful uh, reference point. This needs assessment can very often, even though based on some uh, you know, specific methodology, uh, interviews, focus groups, and so on, can to some extent be a trap that uh, that sort of directs us uh, not necessarily in the right direction. So we have to be critical of those undertakings as well. Thank you, Patrick, I think with this uh, final observation that we need benchmarks as well, what is uh, effective capac capacity building and uh, some sort of standardization and sort of common framework of understanding of, uh, of different um, efforts. So uh, thank you for this. So I think um, uh, now that the clock here is telling me that you have uh, run over time and I'm trying to wrap up this very uh, insightful panel. Thank you very much for um, bringing all these uh, rich comments. And uh, I think um, what we certainly are going to do is just continue what we already have been doing quite well, uh, like uh, making sure that EU capacity building projects will just grow in number and also in expertise. And, and making, making sure that we link up with other efforts in other regions and, and there is also the global layer uh, that we can support. And so, thank you very much. So we will mm, then free, be free for the afternoon now, <laughs> I think. Um, let me do the wrap up of today's conference here on uh, cyber capacity building and uh, EU cybernet project. Today has been an excellent opportunity to bring together interesting speakers on various cyber digital and capacity building issues as well as participants both on site and virtually. The discussions of at the EU CyberNet annual conference have assured us how important is the cooperation between different stakeholders, donors and implementers. The growth of digitalization leads to higher dependency on security of digital solutions. A lot of work needs to be done to mainstream cybersecurity and enhance resilient digital societies around the world. On behalf of the organizers, we are thrilled that so many of you joined us today and hope sincerely there will be many occasions in the future to see each other again at the CyberNet events. Thank you for all participants and excellent speakers and have a great evening. <laughs>